Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are just going to wait a couple minutes as people continue to join, and then we will get started. Thank you all so much for being here today and making the time. Hi, everybody. It's so wonderful to see some familiar faces as well as some new faces. Welcome. Hello. Hi. All right, we're just gonna give folks maybe one more minute and then we're gonna get started because I certainly wanna be respectful of all of your time. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our today's Ask Me Anything, Finding Meaning as a person, uh, as a caregiver to a person living with ALS. Um, my name is Adithina Ryan Minkoff and I'm the Director of Community Support at IMALS. Um, and just a quick note on what is IMALS? Um, we are a patient-centric, movement revolutionizing how to end ALS. And we provide critical support to people who are impacted by this disease. And that includes people who are living with ALS as well as their caregivers and loved ones. And we also empower advocates to raise awareness in the um, fight against ALS and lead the movement in it uh, in driving the development of treatments and cures. Um, a little bit about what today's event is in terms of what is an Ask Me Anything event. It is not just a fun social media trend. Um, it's an idea born out of the IMALS community where ALS advocates living with and impacted by ALS come together to answer questions from an audience of people who are interested in this specific topic. So a couple of housekeeping things before we transition to um, introducing our panelists and really diving into a, a very meaningful conversation today. Um, this event is being recorded and we will share the recording after the event, usually within a week. Um, we, ex we encourage you to use the chat feature uh, to ask a question or the raise your hand feature to participate in the discussion and share your own experience or answer to a question as well as just ask a question. And to raise your hand, click on the reactions icon and then click raise hand. And if you submit a question in chat, we're gonna track all of the questions uh, to ensure that we're able to get to as many as we can during today's event. And if you wish to remain anonymous when asking a question, you can send the question directly to Blake or Ali using a direct message on the Zoom chat. When you are not speaking, please mute yourself as this will allow the discussion to flow without any interruptions or background noise. So a little bit about the format that we're gonna follow for today. We distributed the bios of each panelist via email earlier today. Um, so I'm gonna first pass it off to Allie for some information and then we will come back uh, to our panelists um, and we'll start with a shared question for, for all of them. And with that, I'm gonna pass it to Allie. Thank you. Hi everyone. Good to see you here. 
So my name is Ali Sebesta. I am an ALS support specialist here at IMALS. Our support team works to support individuals impacted by ALS with their emotional and practical needs. So that includes um, anything from providing and facilitating access to information involving understanding ALS, care options, clinical trials, insurance, legal assistance, assistive devices, and equipment needs, among other services. If you have any ALS-related needs that we cannot directly assist with, we do our best to connect you with the person or organization that can. I know ALS can feel overwhelming to navigate and to talk about, especially the larger discussions and planning that comes along with it. So I'm here today to provide emotional support and resources as our wonderful panelists um, continue the discussion on finding meaning. Please know that anyone can joining this call can reach out to me privately, as Auditi said in the chat, um, using the Zoom feature, the Zoom chat feature, and myself and the rest of the support team can be reached at gethelp at imals.org, and I'll put that in the chat. You may also request support through a link from our webpage, which I'll add to the chat as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Allie. Well, with that, um, let's dive straight into our conversation for today. And panelists, as you um, get ready to answer a question, if you can share your name and your connection to ELS um, before you respond to the question uh, the first time, that would be really helpful. So our opening question for today is there is an arc to finding meaning, and we all know it doesn't just happen overnight. So I'm curious to hear from each of you, what are some of the pinpoints in that arc for you from the time that your loved one was diagnosed with ALS to you finding meaning and a sense of purpose again? And uh, Katrina, you are unmuted. Would you like to start off? Sure, um, I'm Katrina Bird. And my connection to ALS is my partner, Dora, of 23 years, um, passed away from ALS on February 2nd, 2020. Um, so our time was so short. Um, she was diagnosed on November 18th, 2019, and then passed away 76 days later. So our um, finding meaning was, had to be quick. Um, at the day of diagnosis, it was a shock. And um, we realized that she was gonna die and we accepted it. But we also accepted that she was gonna live. We didn't know for how long. So we basically woke up every morning and followed a basic routine. Um, I would say, good morning, beautiful. Um, we had a date every day from five to seven uh, central. <laughs> <laughs> and we watched our favorite uh, television program. Um, we, we both love flowers. So I kept a vase of flowers next to her. When she died, there was a vase of daffodils from our yard and we planted flowers. Um, we did, we used to, we love to send cards. So um, some people from her job had given, you know, some, uh, were, were generous and gave some, some things after they found out about her diagnosis. And so we sat down as we would usually do and we made a list of you know who to send our thank you cards to and we designed our thank you cards. So I would say that our way of creating meaning um, was just doing those everyday things because I believe that's what built our relationship period is that these were the things that we always did uh, going to the post office was a big deal we had the usps app so she could that was something she could navigate i didn't have to bother with it she would look on it and she would say hey there are cards in the mailbox and um we got bills too but <laughs> we concentrated mostly on the cards but that was just some of the ways um, we found meaning uh, during that time when she was uh, after diagnosis. 
Thank you so much for sharing that, Katrina. That was really beautiful. And I have a follow-up question for you. Um, since Dora passed, what has finding meaning looked like for you? Um, well, and it took a minute because this, this woman was like my right arm. And so I felt like basically half of my body had been sawed off and I had no idea what to do with myself. So it took some time and I'm still working. I'm still working in progress. Uh, but um, being present is um, one of the things that's very meaningful for me. And it's um, helping me not to betray myself so much. So I'm able to be present to kind of relieve a lot of the stress of ALS brought and, and that, that the world just brings. So being present, taking um, deep breaths, understanding that in this moment, I'm safe. I have th these, you know, being able to look at and understand what's going on with me right now has really, really been helpful to me in finding meaning. I'm allowing myself, giving myself permission to try new things. And um, it doesn't matter if I like them or not, you know, once I've tried it, if I like it, I keep it. If I don't, then I move on to the next thing. Um, advocacy work is a big part of my, <laughs> of finding meaning. Um, so it's, it's still, it's, it's still um, a few more. I mean, it's a lot to, that I have to learn, but these are the things that I've done so far. Um, of course, working in my garden and my animals and, just that, that type thing. I'm on a Zoom meeting. Thank you so much, Katrina. Bob? Uh, sure. Um, you know, at, at first it was a, a big punch. Oh, I'm supposed to introduce myself first, sorry. So Bob Scano, um, my wife passed away in January after a, a few years of battling ALS, and uh, I was her uh, full-time caregiver. Um, and um, to the, the question, I think, you know, at first it was just a big punch in the gut. Um, you know, we, we were just going along, everything was, was good. Uh, two kids at home, everybody pretty healthy, um, was planning on retirement soon, retiring soon, so we were thinking about all that and then you know boom everything everything changed um so how did we uh deal with that and i, I think at, at first the first thing was we believed we were going to be the ones that would beat this <laughs> honestly as crazy as maybe that sounds to those that are in the middle of it we thought there's got to be a way you know we read about some reversals we you know looked at trials tried to get in trials looked into different supplements um you know, the biggest thing was leaning on our faith. Um, we just thought one way or another, we're going to beat it. Um, that, of course, had to transition into managing it. Um, so then it was just managing all the doctors, the therapist appointments, the lists and the routines. Um, you know, it, that was the next phase, just trying to um, deal with the change. Every, it changed all the time. What your routine one day was different than next. And so that was my role, just trying to manage all that. And that allowed Beth to um, be a mom. You know, I, uh, she had to physically deal with everything. I was trying to take everything else off her so she could be a mom and try to be her joyful self because she was a very joyful person. Um, and then, you know, I'd like to tell you the next point on the, the the curve there was, you know, finding the acceptance and, and peace. Um, but we didn't get there before Beth passed, you know, we were we were always in that mode of fighting this thing and trying to manage it. Um, so the acceptance and the peace is, is trying to come down, you know, that, that's something I'm trying to adjust uh, in this phase. Thank you so much for sharing more about 
um, your experience and Beth's experience as well, Bob. And I really appreciate how you framed that in terms of your, your role was sort of to manage the care experience so that um, Beth could really have space to continue to be a parent and a mom. Mm -hmm. And I have a follow-up question for you that I'd love to hear um, from Maya Carter, if you're up for sharing, because I think this question may tie into both of your experiences. Sure thing. Oh, you want me to go now? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Maya Carter. My husband, Maceo, um, is living with ALS now for six years. Um, he has a slow progressing form of ALS. So our journey has been a little bit different. We also have um, four children. At the time of his diagnosis, we had three. Um, and our oldest was about 15. So um, <clears throat> at the time. So... And um, when my husband first like, got diagnosed, um, I'm a researcher. I research everything. And so even with his like first appointment, I was already looking ahead at what could possibly be coming. So when they said ALS, although, although it was a shock, like there's, no words to hear that your 40 year old husband has ALS. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing. Um, I was kind of prepared in a way. I, I had like mentally prepared myself for the news, but not really the reality because you cannot prepare yourself for the reality. Um, and immediately because I research everything I, I found that where we were, we lacked resources. Um, we were in Charlotte, North Carolina. There are other parts of North Carolina that are absolutely great for ALS. Charlotte was not one of those places six years ago. So my first initial goal was to get him somewhere where he could get the care that I thought he deserved. And that's how we got to Arizona. <laughs> um, and then from there, the next thing was, okay, we're gonna have, we're gonna, ALS is gonna be living with us for a while. Like it's gonna be a part of our life. So what do we do with it? You just can't sit here in ALS fog, you know? And so that's where we became advocates and that's where the advocacy work came into play. And not only did it allow Maceo, who's my husband, um, an eternal outlet and a connection to people that we just didn't have here. Um, but it allowed me to connect with people, um, other caregivers. And that's been, a, that's been a saving grace because of the information that has been shared. And then, I'm sorry, then the next part for me was what else could I do? So I'm in these meetings and I'm having these conversations and I know what I know, but I know I could know more. I can't go to medical school because that's just not going to happen. But I can go and get my master's degree and something that I know will become of assistance to those in the community that I now am a part of. And so that's why now I'm in, <laughs> I know it's a lot. I'm a caregiver. I'm a homeschooler. I have a toddler and now I'm in graduate school. <laughs> but for me, Having something that's just for me, something that I can accomplish on my own, outside of my husband, outside of a constant bear that is ALS. It's a bear. It's in your face all the time. Everything you do is covered in ALS somehow. It doesn't matter. Um, to get away from that, I now have school. And it's, it's, a, it's a lifesaver for me. So. Thank you so much, Maya. That was really lovely. I love how you said having something just for you, right? And that I think is sort of the, the essence of today's conversation is having something just for you and finding that space for meaning. Um, so my follow-up question for you and Bob is 
did ALS impact how you parented? Um, and how did that sort of impact um, your process of finding meaning individually for yourself? Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, it is. If you don't mind me going, Bob, I, if you don't. Um, it is, um, like I said, ALS is always present. Therefore, there's some guilt along with parenting, you know, like you still have to um, do school work. You still have, you know, chores, but now a chore might involve helping your dad to the bathroom. That, you know, that's guilt <laughs> um, that we had to, as a, as a family kind of resolve because I can't, I can't lift my husband by myself. Um, so, you know, the 15 year old helps. And so when he doesn't get up and go to school the next day, you're not so hard on him. Probably you should be, but you're not, and you're not gonna be. And um, school doesn't really understand um, children caregivers. So it's really hard to parent at this stage because also I'm also splitting all of that between being a full-time caregiver for my husband. So yeah, parenting is very difficult. And I, I, I feel for Maya because her kids are much younger and I, I think my answer would be quite a bit different um, if, if, if that was the case. Uh, for us, uh, a high schooler and a college and then post-college uh, towards the end um, for my, so my son and then my daughter. Um, I tried my best to let it not affect parenting and not to um and to and and enable my wife to continue to have a just her normal mom relationship as i i said before it was really hard to do a lot of pressure on on time and everything else um i i fortunately i worked from home so i was able to be here all the time and and do all the caregiving for my wife and and not have to pass it on to my kids. Um, but because of the time pressure and things, everything you have to do, the, um, you know, certainly it got in the way and, and there were probably things I dropped. Um, but, you know, you, you just do, you do your best and don't let guilt over, overcome, right? That's it. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Maya. You both touched on guilt and we're definitely gonna touch on that again a little further in this conversation. But before we do, Maya H, would you like to share? Sure, hi everybody. My name is Maya, um, I'm the other Maya. <laughs> um, uh, my dad was diagnosed with ALS just about two years ago. Um, and in the last six months I've become his um, primary caregiver. Um, and I think if we kind of, are we circling back to the finding meaning question? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I guess what I would say for, um, my dad and I and my family, what's been helpful for us is remembering that, you know, whether you're 19 or 99, it's never enough time, um, when you lose someone, and that tomorrow is never promised for, for my dad, for myself. And so um, even though it sounds very ironic and maybe like a little crazy and wrong, um, in my family, we found that ALS has given us like a little bit of time to be purposeful, um, you know, say the things you want to say, do the things you want to do. And um, in the beginning that he looked like, you know, we did a lot of traveling. We saw like all of his friends, you know, we tried to do 
really meaningful, important stuff that would make a great memory and a great picture. So we could look back on it and say, you know, I'm so glad we did that. And in the beginning of his diagnosis, it was definitely very meaningful that, you know, we could still do those things. Um, And now kind of being on the other side, a little further down the line, um, where we can't really do those big things that like I had once thought were so meaningful and important. um, What's become like what's become meaningful to me has been doing the the normal things like Katrina said you know doing the things we like to do um listening to music watching tv just like being together and still managing um to like make the most out of this terrible situation um so I think like when you look at the arc of the the diagnosis and the disease, I think it's like something that's constantly changing, at least it has been for my family. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, Maya. And I'm curious, you've, I, I really loved how beautifully you shared just the purposefulness of this experience or what that has what this experience has given you and your family um but also just finding that sense of purpose in the everyday right in the moments where you're just listening to music and just spending time together I'm curious um what has finding meaning looked like for you as you have navigated these multiple roles of um, you know, transitioning from college to then being your dad's primary caregiver and balancing both? I think initially it was really challenging for me because, you know, I've been a student my whole life up until now. And um, that's kind of what in terms of my life was um, like felt substantial to me, you know, how am I doing in school? What's my next step in my career? And now I've, uh, I've deferred from grad school and I'm home just doing the caregiving. Um, And so in the beginning, it was a bit of a shock because I felt like the thing that I like and I'm good at, I'm not doing, you know? Um, And so, um, but then I began to realize that like, this is like a caregiver is like the most noble job. You know, you're helping someone when they're oftentimes at their lowest and it's someone that you love and it's very honorable. (laughs) Um, And it's definitely something you can always be proud of. Even like, I mean, like any kind of job you have good and bad days, but um, I know that when 20 years from now, when I look back on this experience, I'm going to be proud of what I'm doing, um, that I am helping. Um, and even if like, you know, there's guilt and the day-to-day stuff doesn't always go as smoothly. Um, I do think that, um, like in my life, this is something that will be very meaningful to me. Um, and like, I hope that I will think of it that way always. So I don't know if that answered your question. Sorry. I was kind of all over the place. <laughs> Maya, uh, I'm proud of you for what you're doing. And you're right. This is a very noble um, position that we are all in. And um, some of the things that gets me out of bed is knowing that, um, you know, it's wonderful to have someone who's your hero, who's always there for you. But when you get the opportunity to be there, when your hero needs you and you stay with, and you don't know what, you don't know how long, everything is so uncertain and you're just taking it day by day. And then when it's over, it's like a shock for me. It was like, what did I do? But um, it take it took me some time to get settled in with that. But when I really think about it, um, there was some harshness, um, uh, some cruelness after Dora died um, with her family. Um, And so that kind of um, skewed my 
views of what I'd done. But once I was able to kind of get over that or to get past it, I realized that there was um, harsh criticism on what I did. I did the wrong thing. I didn't do this. Katrina didn't do that. Katrina didn't do that. But there was nobody else being critiqued. And so I had to understand that no, there were no other critiques on anybody else because there was nobody else there. And so when you can give your life for someone that you dearly love, it is a huge, it's a big thing. You may not ever get an award for it, but you have to award yourself and I award you and, and everybody here who has done this. It's not easy, but it is so worth it. And thank you for doing it. Thank you, Katrina, for that. And to everyone here who just heard Katrina say that she awards you, that award coming from Katrina means a lot. So I hope you take a moment just to feel, feel that love and recognition coming through. Katrina, you, um, I want to piggyback off of what you were just talking about. And you previously mentioned this phrase, the sacredness of caregiving, again, referring to the honor and opportunity to care for the strongest person in your life, the hero in your life. Um, and we just heard you share a little bit more about what that looked like during and um, after Dora's passing and the struggles that that came with as well from external sources. I'm curious, how did you in the moment recognize the sacredness of caregiving and how did you and how do you continue to honor the sacredness? So in the moment, um, the daily grind of um, uh, taking care of the dogs and, and Dora and myself um, and, the, and the poor bunny who just passed yesterday. Um, I, I use humor a lot. So um, uh, one way I helped with the sacredness was um, by how I would bring the, the dog's foods in. The dogs stayed in the living room with Dora. And so when I would um, bring their food, like I was a, a server or something, <laughs> it just kind of, I can't believe I'm saying this. Okay, just, it was like, um, Okay, Boots, this morning you will receive dog food topped with a pile of chicken, uh, all soaked in chicken broth, <laughs> you know, just like he was doing fine dining. And that would, uh, that would make Dora laugh. And, but doing things like that, we don't usually associate sacredness with humor, but laughter is, it helps, it cleans the soul. It helps you to deal with a lot of stuff that's hard. So we did a lot of that. Another thing um, during the, with the sacredness in our relationship was decorating. I was um, so frightened because this, she was diagnosed November 18th, 2019. So was I supposed to decorate for Christmas or not? I spoke with a friend, um, who um, had lost her husband to ALS and she said, you decorate it. And I decorated for Christmas and I decorated for whatever holiday <laughs> there was between uh, after Christmas. Um, on the night she died, I had our mantle if, if any of you follow me on Facebook you'll know that the mantle is what I decorate a lot so I had it decorated for Valentine's Day and um, she had died about three-ish in the morning and um, I made the necessary calls and then I turned on the Valentine's lights 
and I'm here in Mississippi, guys, and uh, my partner was white, and I was scared to death um, to have the police come to my house. But the police came, and the coroner, when the coroner walked in, he saw the lights on the mantle, and he looked at me, he looked at her, he looked at the mantle, and he just shook his head, and he said, it's just a different feeling to come to a home rather than a facility. But on the night um, she went into the active phase of death and I sat by her side, that was a sacred moment. I, it's just so hard to describe it, but it was just so, it was beautiful. It was just so beautiful. And I just didn't, I just didn't want to leave the moment, but as every moment does, it, it left and I had to leave it and she did too. When she passed away um, at her family's request, I was invited to sit at the back of the funeral. Um, and I talk about that a lot, but what I don't talk about is how while I sat at the back of the funeral, um, when they, they played a song, um, Amazing Grace, and this was the song that Dora had asked me to sing, the first song she ever asked me to sing for her. And Dora wanted me to take voice lessons. She actually insisted throughout our relationship and made the investment. The closest voice teacher we could find was two hours away. And she invested her time and energy to get me there. And at her funeral, her family put on a recording of Amazing Grace. And um, I slipped into, I don't know what you call it, but I just started singing along. And I didn't realize I was singing along. I just was remembering the song and remembering her asking me and remembering all of our efforts and our love together. And I sang the song and I didn't really remember I had sung it until after the funeral of my friends and everybody was talking about how beautiful it was. And I think that really speaks to our sacredness that I think you know, even in death, I was open to her and she was to me. And um, so now I have to just think about how uh, thinking about forgiveness is the helped me with um, honoring the sacredness of our relationship because I can't have that beauty like I had on the night she died, like I had in the at the funeral. I can't have that if I'm holding on to, to hate toward her family. So I've had to let it go. And so I'm going to just stop right there. And thank you all so much for, thanks for the question. And thanks for uh, everybody listening. Thank you so much, Katrina, for sharing about your experience and your love with Dora and that you had for each other. I think what there were so many little nuggets that I was taking away from what you were sharing. Um, and really it was the biggest lesson is just loving each other, right? The sacredness is in that, um, it's just honoring the love. So thank you very much for sharing that. Would anyone else also like to share about the sacredness of caregiving? Um, sure, I, I will. Um, for for me, it was basically an it was an extension of our marriage vow. Um, uh, it, it could be for other people; it could be any kind of commitment. But we talked a lot about er, ever since we were married, two became one. You know, that's a pretty common thing in your vow, and and I took that very seriously you know so when when beth was diagnosed you know i said we have als you know 
So when she was struggling, I, I told her multiple times a day, you know, my hands are your hands, my feet are your feet. You have an itch, I got an itch. You know, I mean, we, I just tried to just be there all the time for her that way um, because she deserved everything anybody could do for her. So um, it was uh, just trying to live up to that, that vow. Um, that really kept me going. And now afterwards, I think it's, it's much the same. You know, I, I, I go to lengths to keep her alive and amongst our family and our friends. We talk about her all the time. Her birthday's today. We're going to go out a little bit later and have cake together and, you know, talk about her. And um, I work, I try to find quiet time where I can be in places where I feel closest to her. Um, she loved the beach. I go to the beach a lot, uh, or church, and um, and I and I feel her, you know, because of that commitment. So that that helped me be a good caregiver. <laughs> I think. Thank you so very much for sharing that, Bob, and happy birthday to Beth. Yes, I think the the question, at least. This is where my head went uh, a little bit. Was what was Beth's favorite or preferred birthday cake? Uh, good question. But, uh, lots of chocolate and cream, and definitely the icing versus the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the perfect cake. <laughs> Would anyone else also like to share on the sacredness of caregiving? Oh, I think, Dee Dee, did you have your hand up? I did. Um, you know, actually, I just have, I need opinions and thoughts as a, you know, I'll tell you my situation. My best friend has ALS. Um, she has bulbar onset ALS, which is a very severe form and she's end stage now and I spend a lot of time with her I I um do a lot of the caregiving and um I just want to mention this and see if anybody else has had this experience but there is a shortage of caregivers in this country you know, in the hospitals, from the hospitals to private doctor's offices on down to in-home caregivers. And and so uh, my dear friend, Joan, has been so incapacitated so quickly by this disease. She really, it's been a tremendous struggle trying to get uh, caregivers in consistently. And a lot of it has fallen to her husband. And, and uh, she's at a stage in her ALS where she really can't do anything for herself. Uh, uh, you know, long ago, six months or almost a year ago, she, she had the port and she can't. So she takes in all nutrition through the port and she can't talk. But bulbar onset uh, starts in the, in the throat and the, the vocal folds. And so um, she's, so I guess there's, I didn't really have anything to say about how difficult it has been to get caregivers regularly and how much is on her husband is unbelievable. But I just thought I'd put that out there and well, I wonder if other people are having the same experiences. And, uh, but I guess the main thing I wanna say is you know, I know that the biggest gift that I can give is to just be there and, and to take care of her. And I'm doing that. But because she can't speak, she can still write a little bit. Um, I'm not the kind of person that has that can just be chatty all day, you know, I and and I just I'm just I want to figure out ways that I can bring more meaning or think of creative ideas to somehow 
uh, divert her thoughts and attention. And that's where I feel I, if anybody has any thoughts on that subject. What was your name again? I'm, I'm on my phone. That's okay, I'm, I'm Dee Dee. Dee Dee. Yeah. Um, Dee Dee, um, the fact that you're here asking the question, um, I mean, you're already doing so much and I can tell just the fact that you're asking. Yeah. Um, my partner was diagnosed in the late stage. She had bulbar onset. Oh. We had, had 76 days. Yeah. So um, to your question, um, I would say, I mean, what were there things that you guys did before ALS, the jokes that you would share or like um, uh, maybe a funny picture, you know, maybe it, it doesn't have to be anything where she has to actually do anything like type or write. Maybe if you saw a funny meme on Facebook, you know, that you can share with her and something for you guys to laugh about. Yeah. Um, as far as the shortage of caregivers, yes, it was all on me. Um, I had to, we didn't have any equipment. We live in a desert of care, um, which means we don't have an ALS clinic anywhere. Oh, wow. Miles, we didn't even, I didn't even know what an ALS clinic was until I came and started doing advocacy work. Wow. Um, we were given a death sentence and all the help that we could to die. Yeah. So um, the home health nurses who came in, they were nice if I wanted to sit about and have a glass of bourbon and laugh and chat. But I, I still have, I yet have to, to have one of them come help me give her a bath or help me with anything. Yeah, that's true. So yes, it's a, um, it's a shortage of, of uh, reliable caregivers and the ones who are really good I did not get one of those, but those that are really good are not paid enough. Right. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. I think Thank maybe, you. maybe as I'm talking to you about this, I'm realizing that, you know, uh, maybe it's my problem um, because I'm always feeling like, what more can I do to bring some quality into her life? What can I do? What can I do? And so I, we do laugh. I send her uh, pictures every day and when I'm there uh, I try and think of things to make her laugh and uh, but I just feel I guess it's the helplessness mm -hmm. uh, and wanting to somehow distract her and make her more comfortable which uh, you're doing what more can I do yeah yeah you're that's doing that and giving of yourself is not easy. And you're, but you're doing that. This right. is, this is what you, this is what helps. I mean, you, you have a disease, you're dying from it. Your caregiver is worn out. Life is not pretty. A, a laugh, anything to laugh at definitely is a distraction. And I do want to doing that because a lot of friends walk away. A lot of spouses walk away. Yeah, yeah. But you do need to take care of yourself because that's what we're supposed to be talking about here. <laughs> so you have to um, just try to look around for yourself what gives you pleasure. It is okay, Dee Dee, to do that. Yeah, I'm. I'm doing okay. It's. It's. It's just. Yeah. The feeling I have when I feel like I wish I knew what more I can do to, to make her feel better. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and I am there and I'm there right by her side and doing the caregiving. And yet I, because like I said, I'm not somebody who naturally makes conversation and, and, and it's harder when it's one sided. And, and uh, so I, you know, like I said, I'm realizing the discomfort is really within myself. And or mm -hmm. discomfort, I don't know if that's the right word, or just somehow wanting to be more or somehow giving her more. Just be in there, you know, just sit there, hold her hand, play some music. Music always lightens the, yes. the you know, that, that's all you, that's all you need to do. And that's, that's what she needs. Thank you.
Thank you for that, Didi. And thank you, Bob. Maya, you had your hand up a while ago. I just want to make sure before we move to others who also have their hands up. Maya Carter. Yeah, um, Didi, I just wanted to say my husband, when he um, became wheelchair bound, he, one of his greatest fears was being put in a corner and, and like no one um, paying, like no one seeing him, no one acknowledging his presence. And we've, we've been out and about and we've um, observed <laughs> that people have a tendency to not speak to him. They have a tendency not to address him. Right. They have a tendency to, to go to me or they'll even, uh, they'll even address our children about you know, his needs or something before they address him. I think it's important to still realize that they are still, that Cal, uh, Pal is still, they're still there. Yes. And they, and they still don't want to, they want to be treated as if they are still them. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm coming off. No, no, right? no, I understand what you're saying, yes. You know, like being there and talking the way you used to talk. It doesn't have to be work. It's not supposed to be work. That's your friend. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. Like, that's how I feel about my husband. It's not work, he's my husband. Well, you know, it's not, it's not a duty, it's not a job. I, I get people say, wow, it's so great what you're doing. None of those things really, mean anything to me because I I would do nothing else I I could not fathom treating him any other way than the way that I think he should be treated yeah does that make sense and so that's your friend and you wouldn't fathom treating her any other way than what you believe she should be treated yes and that's where it ends it doesn't need to be anything more or anything less or or anything in between that's your friend and when you're with your friend, you're with your friend. Thank you. Yes, you're doing great, Dee Dee. Thank you, Maya. Deb, you have your hand up. Uh, hi, Maya. I, uh, I just wanna say, I think that your friend is so lucky to have you. And what I wanted to share is that there's so much value in the quiet moments. Um, I was the caregiver for my husband, Tim. Um, he's passed and it's been uh, eight and a half years. But I still remember just, um, you know, sometimes people would come and visit and they would feel the need to carry a conversation and fill every moment with words. Right. And it felt uncomfortable, so much so that I put it on my caring bridge that as, as much as we appreciate everybody coming, you know, like just your company, just you being with Tim is, is really all, all he needs. And so um, one of his friends would come over on Mondays and it was Monday movie night. And it wasn't really about a conversation. They'd have a little conversation, but Tim would be sitting with someone else watching a movie. And it's the togetherness that I think really mattered. So, you know, you might be the caregiver, but you can designate Monday movie night. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to share is that um, I've worked in physical therapy. I've done research on um, ALS technology. So I've worked with a lot of ALS patients. And what's come up a couple of times is that they miss being touched. So as their, as their bodies get stiff and they can't move, even just holding their hands and doing a little range of motion, um, you know, just moving their fingers a little bit. I, it's just, I think the quiet and the touch can be very meaningful too. If that's, you know, I, I understand not everybody is a, a touchy feely kind of person. I know my husband wasn't, but he became that because, you know, what you don't have, you miss. So those are just a few ideas, but really the big takeaway is that you're doing great. She loves you just as you are. Don't feel like you have to create conversation. She knows you're not chatty. So you just be you. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Diana. Hi, um, and thank you. Um, I wanted to, sh what I was going to say is a little bit similar to what Deb just shared that, um, not you don't need to feel like you need, I guess, friends 
don't um you don't need to fill empty spaces or quiet rooms just being there i, I remember um so my, my husband passed in july after six years and we used to have he used to love to read and in time he was not able to flip the pages so he had a, he had a book club and his a few friends would just sit and they would hear audible like they would download books and they would just know it was just like you know i always saw it like a guy thing like watching you know sunday football or things like that where you don't really need to talk but you just you just hang out um Another thing that we did for my husband, which we did with our kids, um, I'm not a native English speaker, so I don't know how to say this, but you know the game where you try to guess the movies and you go like this and you try to guess the movies. So my kids made packages with needs. So for instance, there was like my body. So it was like we had, okay, it itches. Um, I need to go to the bathroom, like always with a lot of sense of humor, but they used to make like, 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 like cards when you study, like uh, flashcards, according to his needs. So, so it became their way to communicate, and he was always up to it. So, but they also, you know, they were, they were kind of young at the time, so they almost made it into a game, and he felt comfortable because he couldn't, at the very end, he could, he was not able to, to speak. But of course, he wanted to engage in conversation. So, you know, small things like that, that would just um, prevent. We, we were very keen on, 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 on not having him become isolated or feel um, unseen, like somebody mentioned here. The very last thing that I wanted to mention, and, and, and I, I want to say this um, carefully and sensibly, uh, you started with saying that your friend's husband has a big uh, weight on his shoulder as a caregiver. Um, if patients with ALS can come, uh, as far as I know in my experience, patients with ALS can come in and out out of uh, home hospice care. So uh, that might be an opportunity, and I'm, I don't claim to be an expert, but that might be an opportunity for you to, or for them to look into it. Maybe somebody can come a few hours a day I so appreciate what you're saying. I really and, do. Um, you know, they have it. done all of that, and they're in hospice care. Yeah, okay. you know, and and um, they're in a good position because they have the money and the insurance. But even with that, there are many times when he is her caregiver twenty four yeah. hours a day, and if he can't get the sleep that he needs. Then, then continuing to be her care caker during the day, um, it's it's just not a sustainable situation. But they do they really uh, are very well versed in what is available to them and in the hospice system and and even with that, there's a pro a caregiving problem. But thank you, thank you, thank you, Diana, yes, Carmen. Carmen, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Hi, I'm sorry, it's Carmen. I apologize. I had stepped away from my phone real quick to help my daughter. So okay. sorry about that. Give me the two seconds. Can you come right back to me? Or sure. Uh, you can. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. No worries. Thank you. All right, well, I want to circle back to, uh, to use Carmen's term, um, to a topic that kind of came up a little earlier when we were talking about the arc of finding meaning, and that is guilt. Um, I have heard from many that there's guilt and then there's caregiver guilt. The guilt you feel throughout each day for just taking time for yourself, losing your patience, dreading having to call insurance one more time or that home health care agency or even taking a shower and so much more. So what does that narrative around guilt sound like for you and how have you learned to deal with it?
Um, I guess I can start that. Uh, <laughs> um, that is a word that I have, I have let go of um, because if I allow it in one aspect of my life, it will permeate the rest. There is never going to be enough time. And I tell everyone in this household, I am only one person. And I can only do what my two arms and my two legs let me do. You know, at literally some days, well, most days, I am, I am three people at once. I am my husband's body, I am the toddler's body, and I am my own person. And um, finding, and there's still two other children running around as well. So <laughs> um, finding time to just breathe some days is um, extraordinary. Just this one, uh, one incident, my, my cousin came to see us and she was here for 24 hours, <laughs> 24 hours. And she stopped in the middle and she said, nope, I couldn't do it. She's a nurse. <laughs> she said, nope, I couldn't do it. And, you know, you get into a rhythm and a habit and it becomes your daily life. And it, and it wasn't until she told me, hey, do you realize how much you actually are doing that I stopped and realized that as much as I was doing for everyone else, I was doing nothing for me. I, I wasn't drinking water properly. I wasn't going out for walks. I wasn't talking to my friends properly. I wasn't getting the mental health care that I was, I wasn't doing anything for me. And this is five years of constantly taking care of other people. And it wasn't until that moment that I stopped and was like, well, what do you mean? And she said, your schedule, your upkeep, you're not going to be able to sustain it. And if you don't stop, you're going to drop. And that, that, and there was so much guilt involved when saying, stop, I, I got to take a break. After that moment, I just, she's like, you're going to have to take a break. And if you don't take a break, you're going to break. And it's true. So um, now <laughs> I don't care if I feel bad about it or not. I am going to, and a shower, a shower. I know, I know people say, take a shower. That's, that's hygiene. That's not self-care. <laughs> that's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. Um, you may be doing your nails or, um, you know, getting, sitting in a massage chair. They have those at the mall. That's more self-care, but a shower is not self-care. And I'm sorry to break it to people. <laughs> I, I am one of those girls who will get in the shower and cry, cry, cry my sorrows away. But that's not self-care. That's hygiene. You have to separate your, your, your stuff. You have to separate, separate your things because um, you will get lost in the business of caring because you care. <laughs> well, so. Oh, thank you for that, Maya. That was, I'm, I took a second to come off mute because I wanted to make sure that I was writing down verbatim what you shared and it was, you will get lost in the business of caring because you care. And I just, that is really resonating, right? If you don't make that time for yourself and not the time where you just need to take care of your basic needs your physical needs but take the time to take care of all parts of yourself really how are you how what does that look like for you and we are going to talk a little bit more about self-care in a bit and would at that point would love to learn a little bit more about um what did taking a break look like for you but before we head there um, I want to check with others to see 
if you would like to share more on how you have coped with guilt and, and recognized it. Well, when Dora was diagnosed, I was full of it, I was full of guilt. I felt horrible for eating or even having a cup of tea, um, even with her encouragement. And she finally got me to a point where I would have a cup of tea, but I didn't eat, I didn't eat properly. I lost um, close to 60 something pounds. Um, uh, while she was going through it. And um, so after she felt guilty eating or anything like that, um, I've been working through it a lot. And what I, and I'm gonna give a little different take on the guilt. Um, I like what Maya said about you'll get lost in the caring business. Because um, now in my advocacy work, when I have to do things, um, like recently I went to Boston to speak at the STAT conference. And, um, and I was speaking about me and Dora's ALS journey. It was a very hard thing to do on so many levels. Um, but I kept thinking of it as oh, this is a vacation or you're going, you know, you're getting to, to fly and do all of this stuff. And it's not a big, you know, I had to struggle to think, no, this is not a vacation. This is, this is difficult work, advocacy work that has to be done and you must take care of yourself. And so I did, um, after the speech of the presentation, um, I took time to go back to my room and I took time to cry and have a cup of tea and have water and to just cry again because I feel now, you know, uh, you know, in doing this presentation, it was something I wanted to do. I want there to be a cure to ALS and I want to be a proper represent representative for this. But um, also um, I have to, as we're talking about, I to do self-care as well. And sometimes it has to be so I just wanted to bring up that part of it. Thank you, Katrina. I obviously had to step away for just one second. Um, but I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of speaking towards how heavy advocacy work still can be, whether you're caregiving or not in the moment. Um, Bob and Maya wanted to open it up to either one of you to respond about guilt. Sure. Um, I, I, you know, for, for me, the guilt would have been a, a waste of time concentrating on that. You know, I mean, there, there was a lot to do and we just had to get it done. And um, so it became more of a, how do you, it was, the feeling was stress. And so how do you manage the stress, not manage feeling guilty? And uh, so, you know, you just have to come up with a strategy to, to manage the, the high level of stress you're under. And, you know, one thing was certainly realizing that, you know, my time left with Beth was without a doubt limited. And I just wanted to soak up that time. And, you know, I didn't think of things as chores. I, you know, if I was showering her, helping her with toileting, I was showing her my love. I wasn't doing those chores. I was showing her my love because that was what, what was needed. And then the other thing was thinking about, you know, trying to find a time for a break or whatever. She needed a break too. You know, I mean, she's sitting there thinking about ALS all the time. So if we could go take a walk together, we we're both getting a break, you know, um, just, just get out and stroll around a little bit or roll around in her case. But so um, it, uh, in, in summary, just it's stressful, find ways to, to manage that is the key. Thank you, Bob. I love how you said that of, you know, the simple tasks were how you were just showing her that you, showing her your love. That was really sweet. Maya, H. Sure, yeah, I'll just say one quick thing. Um, for me, I typically experience two types of guilt. I mean, I mean, yeah, 
one is um, after I lose my patience and like whether it's frustrating that he has so many pills to take because swallowing is hard and I'm like, who invented this? Um, and then the other kind of guilt I face is when I do take a break and I'm away, I feel guilty for being away. Like the second I'm away, like leading up to that, I'm like, I need a break. I need a break. And then I get the break and I'm like, how are things going? You know, then I feel a lot of anxiety and I'm very guilty for leaving. Um, and I don't have an answer to that. I still experience this all the time. Um, but like, it's necessary um, to get a break. And the fewer breaks I take, the more quickly I lose my patience, the more guilt I get, and then the time, the, and it's like a horrible cycle that is extremely hard to break. And the only way to break the cycle is to take a break. So um, yeah, and I think guilt is something that happen. It's like when you, like Bob, I think you said it right. Like guilt is just, stress you know it's it's like almost like it's like a fabricated thing because like you know you're a caregiver what do you have to be guilty about <laughs> um and but it's just like the stress of it all um yeah thank you Maya can I just I think Maya hit on something really important um, the stress of it all can manifest in a lot of different ways. And, and sometimes um, I just think as caregivers, we should be forgiving of ourselves. Um, you know, like whatever, you're tired, you're hungry. Those are natural things that as a caregiver, you feel, and you also feel isolated. I don't know about anyone else here, but it's very isolating. There's not many people who understand. And even when they try to understand, people will say stuff like, um, I love this one. So um, how are they doing? Like, <laughs> are oh. they, oh, oh, are you feeling better? Are they feeling better? It's like, no, we don't get better. It's like, there's a lack of knowledge around ALS anyways. So you spend half your time trying to explain to people what ALS is. And by the time you get to that point, then you have the pity looks and you're like, never mind. I don't, never mind. So it's a very isolating, um, it's very isolating for the caregivers as well that I don't, and you add isolation on top of stress. And that's just, that just makes for a tasty cocktail at best. <laughs> so I just think that, um, just as caregivers, be gentle on yourself. Yes, we all um, want to always act in a kind manner and we always wanna use kind words and we always wanna be our best self, but sometimes our best self just doesn't show up. And learning to forgive yourself in that moment will save yourself in the long end. So. I like that, Maya. And sometimes I think I had a lot of stress because I kept showing my best self. Sometimes I kind of want to go back and find a few of these people and punch them in the nose, you know, who <laughs> just said awful things. Um, we had a respiratory therapist who um, Dora decided she didn't want to do the, um, uh, the respiratory therapy. Um, and the, the lady started fussing at her. I mean, she's, she's in her bed. She can't move. She can't talk. And the lady's fussing at her. How do you think you'll ever get better? And I said, ma'am, may I speak with you outside? You know, and I spoke with her and I did it kindly because I was always scared to death that if I got the black, the angry black woman attitude with people that they would take her away. And so now I think I wish I were a little firmer at times, but I did explain to her that she wasn't going to get better. This is it. And if she doesn't want to take the therapy, leave it alone. Thank you, Katrina. And thank you, Maya. Anything, something for us to keep in mind is this concept of best self. We hold to like this 
one version of us where we have idealized how we how we looked, how we acted, how someone else perceived us, right? And what if we reframed to this is the best me in this moment, right? This is all that I can give in this moment. And that's something to keep in mind too, especially as you are feeling more stressed. If that is all that you have in that moment, that is the best version of you for that moment. I like that. Well, we are coming up on time here, but I have one more question. Um, actually, I have a couple more. One is from um, registration. So somebody pre-submitted this question. Um, what are some strategies you use to fight guilt when others step in to help your loved one? Um, so we have entered a stage where Macia has um, taken a couple of falls recently. And like I stated earlier, I am not um, able to lift him, uh, which <laughs> uh, the other day he, he fell backwards and my son was behind him and my son basically beat himself up for about three days because he 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 thought he could catch him um and to prove <laughs> to prove that my to, to prove this to my son my husband was like no you can't catch me you know when we called the fire department which they know us by now <laughs> he's like um and i just want to put this out there if you call your fire department and you ask for a lift assist a lift assist they, they will come and help you lift your loved one. Um, if they fall, if, if anything of that nature, if you need a lift assist, you just call the non-emergency number and they will come and they will help you, um, help you get your, your loved one up, just out there. Um, and he says, son, when, when we have to call the fire department, it's six men who have to come and, and, and lift him up, six men. The two of us, we we are not going to be able to do that, um, and we've 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 now come to that point of realization that we're going to need assistance, and so we went to our neighbors, and um, that was hard. Um, but we went to all of our neighbors around, and we told them that my husband has ALS, and we told them our situation, and we just asked if we could have a phone tree in case we needed help. Uh, it's pride. <laughs> it's not really guilt, it's pride. And um, ALS teaches you to put your pride aside in a lot of ways. Um, we don't live in a very diverse area. Um, it's a very conservative and non-diverse area. So it's very scary having my son who is 15 run to his neighbor's house and bang on their door and ask for help. For reasons I don't think I need to explain, that is a very terrifying thing that we've had to experience. Um, and because of that, um, that's why we went around and told all our neighbors. It was kind of like we had to announce to the world, you know, that my husband has ALS and that's why my son might be knocking on your door. Or, anyways, sorry. Thank you for sharing that, Maya. I wish that a part of me we could have dug deeper into so many of all of, well, all of these responses. And um, unfortunately we only have 90 minutes together today. Um, but my last question to wrap us up for today um, is there's a phrase that is so often tossed around and it means something different to each one of us. And that is self-care and the concept of you can't put on your 
put someone else's oxygen mask on if you don't have yours on first. And it can refer to someone taking an elaborate spa day, or it can refer to someone finding 20 minutes in their day to enjoy a steaming cup of coffee. How have each of you interpreted self-care? How do you prioritize it? In my I'd love for, for you to share more about what that taking a break looks like for you, because I think that is something we get, a question that we get a lot from caregivers. And what does this look like for you? Who would like to kick us off? Hi, it's Carmen. I'm sorry, I had to leave a little earlier. Thank you guys um, for your patience. I wish I could have commented more on so much that was going on, but unfortunately I was trying to multitask as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with trying to do. So um, I want to be able to share is I do one thing for myself every single week and that's go get my hair done. Every time I have a standing hair appointment and I go get my hair done and feel absolutely fabulous while I'm there. And I'm to have a hairstylist that's very intuitive for the lack of a better term. So we have some amazing and even right now I have sprays in my hair. So I won't be going for my weekly appointment, but I'm still gonna go for my weekly therapy with her because that's my my someone who can pour into me and I pour out to them without judgment, you know, condemnation or anything, regard whether it's a good moment or a bad moment. Um there's so many nuggets that were dropped tonight. So I thank you all for everything. Um, guilt, I wish I can tap into that really quickly about the guilt. Um, I have a lot of guilt and I have a lot of unacceptance. Um, I'm still praying for miracles every single day that you know my daughter Asia is, um, has a diagnosed 26 and that was in 2016. Um, they basically told her she had three years to live and here we are six years later. Life um, as is possible continuing to travel, continue to just do what she wants. Sadly, we don't have the best relationship. Um, and I'm praying that it will definitely change. Um, she does have some caregivers that come in not as um, consistent as we would like. There are a couple that are here and help out, but you know, I'm working full time and then my is with her. Um, so there's a lot of guilt in not being able to be who I need to be a caregiver. Um, there's a lot of guilt and that I, that I didn't do that may have brought this on, um, you know, so much guilt and not taking the time to invest in research and do more than learn about ALS. Um, I kind of just accepted it and dealt with life day by day and how we need to do it, um, whatever the task that needed. Asia is her best advocate, healthcare advocate. So she pretty much does everything and just fall in line. I mean, even like her cooking. We, we, at home, we have a joke that she's the executive chef. And my son and I are sous chefs, so she, she basically tells us what to cook for her and how to cook it. And she has an amazing palate, you guys. So um, so I know that's a whole lot, and I'm talking fast, but I didn't want to take up too much time. But I certainly wanted to just, you know, get on and share about what I'm experiencing, where I am, some of the difficulties, some of the challenges, um, the, the feeling gratitude for being chosen to do this. And I say that because when my grandmother was, my grandmother when I was younger, in the early stages of and some minor strokes. So I go to the bathroom on herself. She would need, you know, help. I was the oldest daughter at, at home at the time, so I would be the first one home from school, and it would be my responsibility to get her taken care of. Fast forward to 2021, my mom got really sick, had to come live with us, passing away, and I was here taking care of her, feeding to the whole thing. So I'm familiar with it, but I believe that it was destiny for me. I don't always accept it. I'm not going to. I get really mad, like, God, why did you choose this for me in my life? But it's in a plan and everything, and I'm trusting, continue to trust in him that all will work out for my good. So, again, thank you all so much for all that you shared. I wish I was taking notes, but again, I was trying to multitask and do so many things, but I got so much out of what everybody was sharing. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. That was beautiful, and I really resonated with that. Oh, this child. <laughs> yes, I've, I'm the oldest, and so caregiving has been a responsibility of mine since probably about four or five years old. Right there, with you, Christina, it was part of my destiny, and I, I never knew it. I didn't understand it, but now all things are falling into place. I, I'll just share this little last piece. We had to get a cheerlift for Asia when she wasn't able to go up and down the stairs. Um, and right now I'm having the worst knee issue. So, you know, again, I feel like it was a part of the plan that we'll, I'll have a chair 
I know to help assist me when I'm unable to, you know, do it. Or I could use it now, you know, when that part I do use it. So again, everything, it all has a purpose. I don't know what it is. I got to learn to stop questioning it. I got to learn to stop getting mad about it and just continue doing the best that I can as a mother and as a caregiver. Before uh, we close today, I just wanted to quickly mention uh, that it's a good idea to check the chat window because people have been leaving comments and some of them are helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, Didi. You're welcome. Okay. Maya, Bob, and Katrina, I apologize. Um, Maya Carter had to, to, to leave a few minutes early. Um, did you all have anything that you would like to share around your self-care? I'll, I'll just, I'll try to be very quick. I, I, I agree that it's super important and you, you got to try to find time for it. Uh, but I also want to be honest is so you, you just might not be able to, you know, it, it's really hard. You know, and then and then what do you do? And you know, for me, it was just realizing that being best caregiver is the most important thing I was ever going to do in my life. You know, and and having, uh, you know, then you have faith, you have hope, whatever it is you see as your core in your life that you're going to get through it, regardless what's thrown at you, and uh, and you will. You know, I, I feel very blessed. Got through it. I, I kept my cool. I kept my faith. I didn't burn out. So. You can do it. That was very beautiful, Bob. Um, for <laughs> mine is not so beautiful. I, for me, I really like to cook. I really like to eat food, and so I try not to limit myself. I mean, obviously to a certain extent, but like, I'm not going to get the brown rice. I'm going to get the white rice. You know, I like make the small changes and things that I think would make me a little happier than usual. That's something I like to do, yeah. <laughs> well, Bob and Maya, I think those are great things. Um, when Dora was diagnosed, um, we went to the hospital four times during those 76 days, actually four times from November 1st to January 1st. She stayed about five days each. So one thing that we did or that I did was I took the time, I would stay at the hospital 22 hours a day because she was nonverbal and she couldn't press the call button and I didn't trust the nurses to do right by her. So I went home an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. And so I would take a little time. I know Maya said it was hygiene, but I would take... <laughs> A good hot shower and I would um, always wear something where the nurses and doctors would remember me so at that time I would wear big pretty flowers in my hair and so forth um, and so that would help me um, now I'm taking time to when I do remember to eat and re eat something decent. I take the time to really enjoy the moment that I'm eating. And I love to um, plant flowers. <laughs> I love that. Thank you all so very much for sharing. Um, I know we are out of time, but thank you all so very much to our panelists, to everyone who is here, um, everyone who's asked a question or made a comment or just listened in and showed up. Thank you for being here and thank you for everything that you have done for your loved one with ALS and everything that you are doing. With that, I wish you all a really lovely evening. A um, couple of things I just want to share again, um, as Ali mentioned earlier, um, our ALS support team is here and available if you need some assistance. So we'll put uh, our email and the link to reach out to us and chat again. Um, and we will follow up in the next week or so with some resources um, for caregivers as well coming out of this conversation. 
So thank you all so very much. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Take care. Thank you everyone for your stories. We're early in the, we're early in these stages and it was really um, helpful to hear some of what you guys had to say. Thank you for being here and listening. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.